So I would like to transition us to our keynote. Um, and I'm going to say really good things about him in a minute. But oh, wait. Who has my training letter? Yeah, where's the training letter? And it is on the website. So all of the PowerPoints from today, you can go to the Veterans Clinic Symposium, and you can get the PowerPoints and the related materials, like the training letter. Um, it was floating. Who's got the training letter? Tom? Shout out if she wants her training letter. <laughs> Come on. No, it's way back there, way back there. All right. <laughs> so um, as part of the transition, Greg shared with you his disability picture. But in 1997, he gets a letter from the Office of the Secretary of Defense that tells Greg, he's well aware, you'll remember his unit was six kilometers from Kamasiya. That was one of his bullet points. Kamasiya, Chris Dunn will tell you, was a huge pile of lots of stuff, including chemical weapons, nerve gas, things like that. We know that. It was there. Greg gets a letter from the Office of the Secretary of Defense in 1997, says, when those rockets destroyed that pit, there was low-level nerve agent there, but don't worry, don't worry, because of your location, six kilometers away, you were not exposed to nerve agents, even at extremely low levels. Don't worry, Greg. Well, that was 1997, but by, by 2003, five years later, Greg needs to start thinking about worrying because the Government Accountability Office does a preliminary report concluding that the Department of Defense got it all wrong. And the pre preliminary assessment of the DOD plume, which Chris will walk you through, showed that, in fact, our troops, uh, Greg Beer, was exposed to chemical agents preliminarily in 2003. So maybe he should start worrying. By 2004, definitely worry. GAO, GAO made their preliminary report final and found that DOD's earlier conclusions about U.S. troops exposures simply cannot be supported, okay? So this brings us to why do we have our keynote today, who's going to talk about geospatial proof and geospatial evidence and why it's so important for us as advocates to be able to prove where our veteran was. Because when they're working in these environments, if we can show they were only six kilometers away, that's something we're going to want to urge to VA, their proximity. And Chris, I'm just thrilled that he's here to share this information with us. He specializes in this area. He's a geographer. He's a lawyer. He was one of the first students in the Veterans Clinic paving the way for other students in the Veterans Clinic on that rocky road. He was a catalyst to what we do today, and I'm just very, very proud to have him as a keynote speaker today. And he'll tell you about his military history, which is very impressive, but let's all welcome our keynote speaker, Chris Dunn. Okay, now I'm not a fancy talking lawyer, and when she asked me to do this keynote, I gotta be honest with you, I was shocked. So, I will, tr my goal here today is to not embarrass Professor Drake. And now I'm going to show you my PowerPoint and we'll do the keynote. Oh, all right. Okay, here we go. The official title is Using Geospatial Data to Establish the Nexus that we've all heard everyone talk about all day between the veteran's claim and their injury. And there are certain instances, not every single instance, when it really makes sense to be able to use whatever evidence you can gather to put the veteran at a particular place in time where bad things happened. And this is a favorite old quote. Um, a lot of people have claimed it. But essentially, this truly is how most Americans learn geography. It's they, you know, they see it on the news, and they wonder where their children are going off to. All right, here's the takeaway. If you don't get anything out of my keynote, this is it. This is a real tool. I'm actually what they call a geospatial expert witness. 
I have been called in to testify in court. I've made maps. And what my, you know, either Daubert or Fry, I can do either one. I, you know, I'm a switch hitter. So I can help you come up with, uh, I can't help you invent information, but I can help you take the information you find through your investigation and process it through um, a respected and uh, well-established process or set of techniques that other folks are using. Keyboard's messed up. Okay, lawyers in the Army. Professor Trachtenberg, this one's for yours. So this is an actual danger warning label that somebody in the chain of command or some attorney said we had to put on things that are purposely designed to blow up and kill people. So, all right. Here's what I hope to cover today. What credible supporting geospatial evidence of an in-service stressor, now that's mostly for PTSD, you know, we'll also talk about um, presumptives, and why do you need this? How are military geospatial records different from civilian information? And there is a vast, vast difference. And what are the potential sources of geospatial records that you can find and um, use to support your claim? That the veteran was where they said they were? And how to challenge it when the government, you know, for instance, this Comasia thing that we're going to talk about a little bit in detail. Why? In uh, 1997, the wind was blowing this way, and then in 2002, well, the CIA said the wind was blowing that way, and, you know, um, what do you do when the government may not have gotten their uh, analysis correctly? Okay, and where can you go for more resources? Which is really what this is about, because I don't expect you to learn the geography, but I expect you to know that um, it's out there, it's helpful, and how do I find more? So, okay. These are my three favorite things. I love geography, I love the law, and I love veterans' issues. And that's my son down here on the, the left as he graduated basic training. And he was in Djibouti, and he was exposed to the burn pits. So it's family tradition. So there we are. We're the nexus. OK, who's this guy, and why is he the keynote speaker? Well, I was in Desert Storm, um, Desert Shield. My EOD unit was down at Fort Hood, and I actually grew up as a kid at Fort Hood. And at 13, I had a street legal motorcycle, and in the state of Texas, I could ride to junior high. I also had a little bit of a mustache coming in, so I was a bad, bad dude. And when you live next to Fort Hood, which is about the size of Boone County, you rapidly discover that in the very middle of it, there's this thing called the impact area. And the impact areas where all the artillery rounds and bombs and everything are dropped and where soldiers leave things accidentally or on purpose. And when you're a kid and you got a motorcycle, um, you go explore. And so this is sort of how I ended up on this journey into the bomb disposal. And then I was also what they call, uh, these days they call that kid Aspie, you know? And um, I was just really into certain things and then at, 14, I think PBS started broadcasting a show about the bomb squads that saved England and London during World War II. It's called Danger UXB. Now, my dad's a, you know, a college football player and this embarrasses the heck out of him. I used to rush home so I could watch PBS after school, you know? And this, I saw this show and then one day we were up at Fort Hood and we were out hunting and we drove by this magical army unit that had high concertina wire fencing around it and it had all these bombs and stuff in the yard and there were missiles on sticks and all kinds of really cool things. And I asked my dad, what's that? And he goes, son, that's EOD. They're weird. Stay away from them. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like I was predestined to do that. So anyway, at 47, I hated my life and I said, I got to go do something different. So I came to law school. I never regret a moment of coming here to Mizzou. It was fam amazing experience. It was really hard, uh, especially when you're old. And um, I met Professor Drake and I met a lot of really cool people. Um, I did tell Bob Bailey one time that I was really worried about getting clients after law school because, you know, I was 50 and I knew no big law firm wanted a 50-year-old rookie. And Bob gave me the best words of advice I got in law school, which was, Chris, don't worry. Not everyone can afford a good attorney. So. <laughs> I knew I, I knew I was on it. So, 
All right, this is what I do for a living. I walk down the steps of courthouses in suits and I pretend I'm a fancy attorney. Pat Nolan took that photo for me. All right, I also have a shovel and some equipment and stuff where I go dig up things. And not a lot of attorneys keep a shovel as part of their basic kit, but, and I've got some geospatial tools. This is my expensive GPS on a stick, which if you ever have a crime scene or something like that, um, I also do some crime scene modeling. Um, you'll need one of those. That's Nikki. She just graduated. She's back down in Arkansas. She helped me out at a crime scene one day. And then occasionally I go to other states and I, you know, exotic places like Arkansas, and I talk about geospatial issues and the law. And occasionally I get to go on the Jumbotron. Thank you, Greg Beer. So that was this last weekend. It was an awkward story. Okay, this is my real world. This is my desk down in my basement. My morning commute is I grab my coffee, I go downstairs with my dog, and I sit at this thing, and this is my mapping station. And it's really kind of a cool place where I use a tool called Geographic Information Systems. And for those of you that aren't really spatial thinkers, um, think GPS, think word processing, but basically what all of us geographers have done over the last 20, 30 years is We've moved away from paper and vellum and ink, and everything is now digital. Every piece of ground or line or anything has all kinds of electronic aspects or um, uh, attributes. And by using a geographic information system, you can process this stuff, and you can get valuable insights into information. I made a GIS to start on this veterans law program um, and what I did is I started assembling all of the available information I could find on the first call four and the, the release at Camasilla, which we will get to later. And what I found was a lot of this stuff had been issued in 1997 or 2000, 2002, and it had never really made it into uh, digital mapping. And there wasn't a lot of information there, and that w I had to start putting it together. Over here on the left, is the, uh, these are, each one of those is a, a layer. It's a mathematical description of some feature on the earth. And we'll get into the kinds of layers that we have later on. But these are, um, this is just a screenshot of the GIS. Now, Greg Beer was right here. And later on in this presentation, I will show you um, exactly when he says he was within six uh, kilometers of Kamasia. You need to understand, Kamasia is two miles long. Greg was basically just outside of the fence. And these are the plumes that I've digitized that show the CIA's various models of release. And then all those little dots in here, and I should probably, I guess, so. these little dots, brown spots, that's where the military said there were units. Now, they've never given us up the data and told us which exactly which unit was there, and there's some presumptions that, well, if your headquarters is here, all, all the troops are there. Well, that's not necessarily true, because, you know, I myself was roaming all over the place at the time. So, geographic information systems, and as the gubernator says, it's like Google Earth, but better. So, and we'll get into Google Earth later, too. He's actually a big proponent for uh, GIS systems. Now, when Bob Bailey, um, when I told him I was going to go off and be a big, bad geospatial attorney, which he doesn't think exists, this is what I think he thought. He's sort of a, a Saul Goodman approach to the law. And so this is my commercial. And hopefully it won't be too loud. So I want you guys to call me Flash. All right. Okay. It sounds silly, but have you noticed every single app you have on your smartphone now wants to know your location? Why? It, because they care about you, right? That's exactly why those folks want your location. They want your location because there's big money in your location. They're, your phone is a highly accurate, um, much more accurate piece of positioning equipment than um, some of the major guidance that was used in uh, you know, NASA's space shuttle system. They're amazing bits of technology and knowing who you sh where you shop, what you drive by, and when you do it 
is money in their pockets. And the geospatial sector, when compared to the civilian airline sector, and these are recent numbers, okay, 1.6, and that's everything that moves. People, um, packages, you know, that's including FedEx, UPS, the Postal Service, and the geospatial sector was a tenth this 20 years ago. And it's rapidly catching up and it's a very mature sector and there's an awful lot of information in there. People are getting real PhDs in this sort of thing. It's, you know, it's, um, it's blooming and it's out there and there are all kinds of amazing contract issues, privacy issues, um, constitutional law issues in this, in this area of law and I just find it fascinating. So. That's what I do. Now, let's talk about uh, bad things that were in the first Gulf War. All right. As we said, most VA presumptions have a basis in geography. Now, I'm glad to be here today because I honestly, and is, I'm not trying to be dramatic, never ever thought I would live this long because I knew all of the things I had encountered in the Gulf War, and I also knew that I'm somewhat uh, high risk tolerant and so perhaps you know getting to this age would be a surprise one of the i when i was in germany in the 90s i worked on a tank that uh, was full of a battle load of depleted uranium penetrator rounds and it burnt and my job was i was the first guy in there i went in to see that everything had um that was supposed to burn had burned and it's you know covered with alpha radiation. When I got out of it, they measured the uh, inlet on my gas mask. It was literally 50,000 counts of alpha per second at the entrance to my gas mask. And so you go through a whole decon procedure. Depleted uranium is not really that dangerous unless it's passing through your tank or uh, vehicle at a high rate of speed, or if you're breathing it after it's been in a fire. Um, we mentioned the nine infectious diseases that were in the Gulf. Smoke. Okay, has anybody ever seen the movie Jarhead? I, I don't know the accuracy of the whole movie, but the scenes of the oil well fires were dead on. If you ever want to see what it was like with this, it's night, there's these candles burning out of the desert, and um, oil's dripping down from the sky, dead on accurate movie. Um, the PB t pat tablets. These were, like Greg said, little tiny tablets that we were supposed to start taking two to three days before the war started. So when we got exposed and we were fully expecting to get zapped by um, Iraqi nerve agent, that um, you know, we would uh, somehow be able to slough it off and our antidotes would work better. Now, the night before the war, when I suggested that we all shoot each other with little tiny bullets, so the big bullets didn't hurt as much, that did not go over well with the commander. <laughs> So, but luckily he had a war to fight and did not have the time to do my Article 15. So, all right, there were a lot of heat injuries there. Burn pits, we talked about the burn pits. Now, one of the things I want you to know in the burn pits is there was talk of or that soldiers threw everything in there. They threw the, th the evidence they needed to hide in there. Um, one time we got called because uh, this uh, group of soldiers accidentally bent a tow missile. And so, oh, we'll just throw it in the burn pit. It'll be cool. Well, the tow missile, when it got caught on fire, uh, shot out of the tube and skittered across the desert for about a mile and a half. So stupid things went into the burn pit. In addition, you've seen those uh, photos of the soldiers out there burning the latrines, okay? I don't know how bad that is for you health-wise. I know how bad it stinks. But one of the things we'll touch on is we were as soldiers, we were pouring this third world, uh, developing world pesticide, which means it was effective, okay? None of the stuff we have in the United States is actually very good. But over there, there's no OSHA, you know, or uh, Food and Drug Administration. And so the stuff worked, and they're sprinkling it in the pooper so to keep the flies down, and then we go burn that. Well, that's actually a pretty good nerve agent uh, dispersal method. All right, the commissia. Greg talked about the fact that there was not a standard set of ordnance over there. One of the things about explosive ordnance disposal soldiers is we are trained on nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, uh, improvised explosive devices, conventional munitions, the United States' munitions, and all foreign countries' munitions. When there was this big rush to get rid of Kamasia, which was the big crown jewel of ordnance uh, depots uh, that we had captured, 
all of the explosive ordnance disposal folks said, you know, all of our training says we need to identify everything we blow up before we blow it up. So in our defense, sorry about causing Gulf War syndrome, I, I apologize. We really did try to do it right, but at a certain point when the people with the stars tell you it needs to go by this date and time, you go out there and you do your best. So, whoops. All right, experimental vaccines. I, you know, I used to watch a lot of X-Files. I'm not exactly sure what was in these vaccines, but I know I wasn't really given a choice on whether I was gonna take the vaccines, uh, but I'm not paranoid at all. Um, I, I trust that they were in my best interest. All right, chemical agent resistant coating. This is, this is paint that you put on vehicles that will make sure that after we're zapped by a chemical attack, the vehicles still look pretty. That is their only function, okay? That's what this paint does. It keeps the camouflage on the, uh, the vehicle. And if you've got so much nerve agent on the hood of your Hummer that it's taken the paint off, you've got other issues. But the Army thought this was a really great idea. And they, so when the vehicles are coming in on the boats and they're rolling off the dock, there's guys out there with uh, uh, handkerchiefs on and they're using the painter and they're taking green vehicles and they're making them brown vehicles and kind of walking with them as they paint them. It was the world's largest Earl Scheib. All right, concussive forces. Things, there was a lot of banging over there, a lot of loud noises. Diesel fuel, Greg talked about this. Our shower water was, after they hauled all the diesel up to make the tanks rumble and go, they said, well, hey, we can use these same tankers. We'll wash them out once and then we'll start using them to haul the shower water up. So it was, yeah, every time I took a shower, which was rare, uh, you know, I got to smell like a, a diesel. Okay, there's a lot of noise, we mentioned that. Okay, occupational hazards, there's a lot of different jobs. What you were doing is you were mixing very young men and women with very dangerous things, mechanical things, and things were moving. And you know, my greatest fear was getting run over in my sleep. And, um, so you were very selective on even where you went to sleep at night because people were tired. The first, the, the ground invasion that Greg talked about, I was a little further in towards the Kuwait side. I think I was up for 72 hours straight at, at one point and I'm wearing mop gear and I'm taking these PB pills. I probably was not making good decisions past hour of 60, you know? So it's a dangerous job and then pesticides. Okay. Oh, I forgot about toxic frag. A lot of our little bomblets have special <coughs> kinds of metals in them that are um, designed to be extra sharp when they blow up. That's, there's a downside to the chemical reaction, and I, I don't really have all the answers, but there's links in um, Professor Drake's, we're going to talk about a website later, the, the links to every single one of these issues at the VA. So our focus is finding and using uh, these geospatial geographic records. Basically our focus is finding geography to support your client. So here we talk about the presumption. This is a VA form. By the way, I am not a veterans law attorney. It requires um, a different kind of brain than I have. I do not know veterans law. I went through the veterans law clinic and that served to tell me never to do that because it would be malpractice. But I, I love supporting it. And so if you have a question on the veterans law aspects of this particular keynote presentation, please talk to Angela or Amy or David or somebody that really knows veterans law. And if you have a question on the geography, of course, get a hold of me. But are you claiming a disability related to an environmental hazard exposure? just listed the exposures. There's a lot of them. Now what we can do is we can start putting things together and finding locations. This is Lieutenant Dave Harville and I. This is, uh, we went out and took a couple photos. Now remember, this is pre-9-11, this is pre-digital cameras. This was a disposable um, uh, Kodak wind-up camera and we had a bunch of them. So we went out, shot a bunch of rolls and then we dropped these in the mail and sent that home case we didn't come home. So this was also my son's second birthday and seriously they gave the lieutenant a grenade launcher because we were a 13 person unit and our job was after the tanks went through we went in 
behind the tanks, as they went through things and destroyed them, they left things. Our job was to be right behind them, throwing demolition charges into the things they missed. And our Hummers were up armored with hefty bags. I don't know if you've seen the old school Hummers that have plastic doors. So we're running around the battlefield in that. And uh, Lieutenant Dave was damn good with the 203. So, all right, credible supporting geospatial evidence of an in-service stressor. This is the um, part where it applies to post-traumatic stress disorder. These guys, this is an EOD unit, and they were shooting their Christmas card to send home to everybody. This is from OIF, and these guys are definitely not stressed. This is a happy experience for them. So, all right, what we're trying to do is request and tie the evidence that a stressor occurred, and we're trying to corroborate this in-service stressor. Just a quick thing. Um, in my youth, I was a tagger. Has anybody ever seen the, the movie Red Dawn? Um, in the, yeah. Okay. I went through a case of orange spray paint in Iraq, and everything we destroyed, we tagged with Wolverines, basically, because that, they were, basically, we still looked at the Iraqis as the Soviet Army. They were, we were playing their, 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 um, their Bush League team, I guess, is how we looked at it at the time. So we wanted to let those uh, Reds know they weren't going to win. Okay. What constitutes credible supporting evidence? Indicates the veterans served in the immediate area and at the particular time in which the stressful event is alleged to have occurred and supports the description. The further back you go in time, the more general... Um, Civil War diary stuff, they'll talk about being at Manassas and they'll talk about things, but as you go forward in time, you find that the precision of the geography, if you can get it, becomes more and more precise. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about as far as sources. This tower, uh, has anybody ever heard of the neutral zone? The neutral zone, which is not in Star Trek between um, the, was the Romulans and the Federation, there is an actual thing on the ground called the neutral zone between Iraq and um, Saudi Arabia. And the 1st Armored Division, who was, I was with those folks, um, they went through the neutral zone. And this is a Saudi border tower. And you can see the monster uh, sandstorm that was occurring the day of the ground invasion. I don't know if they planned that or not. But these are, these are Hummers over here. And by the way, I invaded Iraq in a Mercedes Benz. Now, not a lot of people can say that, but we, our, our unit had this little truck called a Unimog, and it was designed to dig up bombs. And it was kind of cool driving a stick, too, into a, uh, Iraq. All right, the degree of the stressor corroboration includes the, the claimant's personal information, and it implies the... Um, personal exposure, and I'll just let Amy Odom talk about the case law on that because I'm sure she won these cases too. So, all right, what is being in combat? That was one of the questions that we talked about as we were preparing this. Um, are you in combat if, um, you know, you can hear the guns? Um, this night, I was up, and um, this is all of us, Greg talked about his map where there was nothing on the map. It was like the surface of the moon out there, and um, it is the most beautiful sky you will ever see in your life in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert. And on a low humidity night, you can see the depth of the Milky Way. And I'm up that night. It was my night to watch the kids. And this is the, the last night of the air war, and the ground war is kicking off early the next morning, and I see this light moving through the sky and it just keeps getting closer and closer. How many of you guys have actually seen a missile re-enter the Earth's atmosphere streaming towards you? That's an amazing experience. And it really is. And you know, I'm looking up and, uh, you know, just like in the Bugs Bunny cartoon, well, that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and, um, and it hit about 10, 15 miles behind me, which doesn't sound like, yeah, it sounds like, well, that was way away. Surprisingly, 10 to 15 miles behind you is not that close when it's a missile. So um, we loaded up our trucks, and in the back here, this is probably four or 500 pounds full of C4 
The trailer's full of our clothing and stuff that we could abandon, but we had to make sure we had the explosives. And we had our little charges set up so we could sling them into things and blow them up as we passed by. And we operated, we were 13 people. We operated as a, a headquarters element, which was four people. They kept uh, the chow coming and uh, you know, made sure we got resupplied. And then we had three three-person EOD teams. One person drove, one person slung charges, and another person was up on top of the Hummer with a, a rifle making sure you no know, bad people jumped up and, and did anything. And so we, you know, we'd switch off too, because you get bored. So, all right, primary evidence. The government likes the government's cleaned and polished evidence the most. This is sort of the hierarchy of evidence, you know, the litany of saints, you've got the disciples, this is the disciples right here. These are their official sources and good luck getting information down to the Joe level. You're not going to find a lot of that at these particular sources. So, all right, SNP, talk to you about this pesticide. This stuff was so amazingly effective and we didn't have HBO, you know, we, we had Game Boys but that was the extent of our uh, electronic entertainment. So what we would do is after a meal, we'd put a little honey in a, in a paper tray and it would draw the flies in because the, the one thing you count on in Iraq is flies. And we'd sprinkle this snip, which were these yellow and red um, kernels into the tray and we would watch flies die for about an hour or so while we sharpened our knives and told amazing stories. And you can tell this is an EOD in it because this is a uh, early model pan disruptor. Here's a pitcher with some uh, Johnson's baby shampoo, some Motrin, some baby powder, a scrub brush, and toilet paper. This, these are the creature comforts. So, and I still have this thermos right here. All right, there's just stuff everywhere. Okay, we talked about the primary level of evidence that they want to see. These are the real levels of evidence that if you can get a hold of this information goes a long way towards proving your client's um, position, location, and relationship to what was going on in the theater. And generally documents written or recorded by the lowest possible unit in the chain of command are the most probative source. The lowest possible unit is typically whatever level there was a lieutenant at. If there was a lieutenant in that unit, that lieutenant was probably doing, um, probably was tasked with the job of uh, creating logs. In our 13 person unit, we had uh, Lieutenant Harville, you saw him there with the grenade launcher. His job was he processed all the information, he recorded everything we did, and he did a great job of this. And he did not even know that it, the logs were still available. And I'll tell you, tell you about that later. But they're amazing sources of information, and sometimes, you know, there were personal notes in them and other sort of things. And that information really helped me recreate a lot of the, uh, the evidence I needed when I was working on the Comisia project. So this is a photo of me standing all, you know, puffy. And I was, you know, I was 27 and bulletproof at this time. And this is like two days after the ground war is over. And this is a bunch of their things. And we all wrote it down and it was in a big log. And this is one of their uh, armored vehicles and soon thereafter we covered it with uh, some C4 and we didn't want to just completely vaporize the vehicle. You want to scatter it around the desert. You want to sort of leave a mess. That was our, our national policy at the time. We've since decided we don't do that anymore. But this is the log of my EOD unit that I was able to find online when I was researching the Kamasia issue and this, believe it or not, really is that entry where it recorded this stuff. And I've got video of this too. And this was 1991. You know, the information for your OIF, um, our Global War on Terror, GWAT uh, soldiers, is more prevalent. And they had more um, d devices. But this location right here, this is um, exact latitude and longitude. This because it's four digits past uh, the decimal point, that's gonna get you within 150, 200 feet. So, all right, other secondary sources. Letters from other soldiers, letters home, scribblings, uh, DD-214s. 
It doesn't specifically say geospatial information is allowed, but it is um, implied, and we'll talk about that a little later. Here's some of the oil well fires, great photos. And it says you attach these materials that support your claim. And here's another photo. One of the interesting things about this particular photo is this is um, a main MSR. I believe this was Virginia, which is military supply route. And uh, shortly after the uh, successful ground invasion, what we started seeing was buses of people that worked in the rear, and all forward soldiers have polite names for soldiers that worked in the rear. Uh, they would come up and um, they would be in these immaculately tailored clothes, and they would stand and pose in front of these various war trophy things. And we got the orders basically to push the, all of this stuff off of the road. These particular tanks had a bad day because as they were driving during the air war phase, an A-10 came over, went bleh, and there's all kinds of little holes in these tanks on the other side, not on this side, but that also meant these tanks were just covered in, in depleted uranium, in addition to having burnt out and whatever ugly ordnance was in there at the time. So what we did is we basically piled up a whole bunch of C4 on this side and did a kind of a heave it out into the desert. And so we cleared the road, and then we only left one or two really safe trophy looking things folks could climb on top of and, and hold their flags up. And I still see these photos on in Facebook every now and then. And I go, yeah, I know when you got there, and, and I know your uniform was pretty when you got there. So, all right, geospatial sciences. This is sort of a lead up to a Venn diagram. There's all the geospatial sciences. There's the civilian stuff. This is property law sort of things. This is how we map property. Then there's the military geography, which is completely different. They have different concerns. And then there's the secret military geography. This is, you know, what do they call this? Um, the, the dark geography is a term I've heard of it. All of the digital stuff that I work with now sometime in the past was was handwritten, was maps, or was uh, script writing in some sort of deed. And as time has progressed, this has been translated into digital, and these are the basic elements, if you will, of uh, geography. There's points, there's lines, there's polygons, which are lines that go around and bound to space. For instance, Missouri is contained within a polygon. My my property, my house is within a polygon, and then there's images, and there's not just aerial photos. There's all kinds of different sensory images. There's, there's LIDAR, um, there's near-infrared, there's an amazing world called remote sensing that uh, gives you more information than just an aerial photo will give you. And the government has tons and tons and tons of this, and they also have a lot of it for these war areas. In addition to that, there are a lot of private firms out there that have been collecting this information since the first Gulf War and will gladly sell it to you if you need it. Now, there's positional information. You know, there's the old XY. We remember that from uh, geometry. You know, so far on the X axis and so far up on the Y axis. Or there's radian information, which is I'm at this point so many degrees away, so far of a distance away. So position information can be given in a lot of different formats it doesn't, it always translates into another format. So if you do encounter position information that's in a sort of an awkward format, we can get it into another format. And like I said, behind all of this information is attribute data, which might be tons of relief supplies, the location of a particular vehicle or tank, fire hydrant, you know, and I do a lot of medical mapping. It might be an actual patient with a medical record. So. Here's civilian geography. The focuses are on these various things. And, you know, this is all stuff that makes perfect sense, right? And I want you to read this side on the military geography. This is, the, this is what the military focuses its geography on. And these are a bit flippant, but it's true. This is how they process everything. And by the way, does anybody know what this particular weapon system is? Yeah. This was the enlisted man's nuke of the Cold War. I'm not kidding you, this is the nuclear bottle rocket you may have heard about, the one where you drive up and if you saw the Soviets coming into Western Europe, you'd send an E6 and an E5 out with this nuke on a stick and we'd shoot them and then run away real quick because the blast area was kind of 
almost the size of the, uh, the range of the nuke. So <laughs> this is a real thing. And we, no, I can't tell you that. Sorry. Um, all right, moving on. Not going to give the secrets away. All right, secret military geography. There is a complete, uh, ge the National Geospatial Intelligence AG Agency, or NGA, which, you know, most of it's located here in St. Louis. It is, it is, uh, it is the X-Files of geography. Don't even go there. Don't even try to ask for information. Do all your FOIA requests through to the Army and other things, or the Navy, whatever. Yeah, don't even bother these guys. You don't want to be on their radar. Okay? Not that they're bad people. It's just you would end up on a list. And we know how that works. So that's geography. All the geospatial sciences, here's the civilian stuff, here's the military stuff, there's a little bit of overlap between them, and then the secret stuff is in there. We talked about what countries were in Southwest Asia earlier. This is the official Veterans Administration map, and this is Iran, this right here is Afghanistan, and this is Pakistan. Now, any geographer who's been classically trained will tell you India is South Central Asia, and if you're a country away, you're kind of like West, South, Central Asia, and then when you get one more country away, which is Afghanistan, you're um, basically either Far Eastern, Southwestern Asia, or Southwest, Central Asia. So, there it is. Uh, I don't know how they do this, but these are the list of the countries. The waters of the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea and the Red Sea and the airspace above these locations. So if you served at Whiteman Air Force Base in one day, um, you drove to work and you got in your B-2 bomber and you flew over there and you dropped a bunch of bombs and you came back, you've got service in the area. So good on you. So, All right, geospatial records, they are different. Um, and the military has multiple location and positioning systems that they use. When I was in uh, the, the first Gulf War, we were given a device called a LORAN. And a LORAN is a, um, uh, it's a navigation system used by uh, merchant marine vehicles. It uses these towers that are located near the shore, and you get a bearing and distance to the tower, and it sort of calculates a GPS location. And you know the global positioning system was just coming online. Handheld units were only really issued to the Special Forces guys at the time, and so there were some there were some conversion issues coming out of the LORAN. The military also uses a grid system, and you know, you, have you ever seen that meme on the internet that talks about how um, the Mercator uh, projection of the Earth is racist because it makes Africa really small and Europe is huge? Has anybody ever seen that? Just okay, I've, I'm a bit of a geek, so yeah, I probably have seen things you haven't. Um, there's a reason why we use the Mercator system. It's because young people who fire cannons can hit things much more effectively if they're using that grid system. And it, does, it makes the math easier. And that's the real reason the military uses the Mercator system. And it's, um, it's not because they want to you know, diminish the participation of people from a particular continent. But that system doesn't look anything like the Latin lawn you might see on the Garmin that's in the dashboard of your Tahoe. All right, this is a, a couple of examples of geographic information in, this, in different systems. You've got degrees, minutes, seconds. You've got degrees, uh, minutes, decimal degrees. And you've got, um, you know, okay, latitude and longitude. UTM, Universal Transver Transverse Mercator. Um, military Grid Reference System, which is row five right here. That's a military grid. And when you're calling that in to, you know, the Vietnam guys, you know, you called the grids in, and the more numbers that were in that grid that you called back, the more accurate their fire was. Because the longer this particular bit of information is, the, the narrower the uh, level of error is. And then I won't get into all of these, but there's ways to move information back and forth between these different systems. Here is an actual location out in the Kuwaiti Desert, not too far from Kamasia, which was up in this area. And these are some of the different ways 
this information could be recorded. Now, let me ask you, if you saw this, would you think that was information location or location information? Most people seeing that for the first time would think that was some kind of unit call sign or um, some supply number for getting more MREs, whatever. So that's how location information is stored and how it's different from the civilian stuff. Now, here's where it's at. Here's where you can help your clients find this information. Think like the CIA. How am I going to determine where my people were? What um, reverse engineering tools can I use? Old cell phones. It's, if they've come back with a cell phone, and a lot of guys roll over there with these international plans. And you know, when I was in the first Gulf War, we had access to a tent every two months where we could make an eight minute phone call in, in two in the morning local time back here in the States. These guys are rolling out with uh, Garmin jogging GPSs on their, um, their wrist. They're, they've got laptops. They've got uh, handheld GPS devices. Uh, I know a lot of guys carry a, a, a GPS in their battle rattle. And you know, we've actually hit uh, terrorists in Syria because they're taking photographs and they're geotagging those photographs. Because they don't even know they're geotagging it. It's just, you know, that's the default assumption of the camera that they're using is to kick on the, the GPS and figure out where it's at. And some of these geotags aren't just a location. They're a location and a direction and a distance on some things. It's amazingly precise information. But where I find most of the information when I go looking for something that happened in a particular area is I go to non-governmental organizations, especially uh, folks that are promoting peace, believe it or not, keep some of the best records of where things happened. And the, you know, there are a couple of databases out there, and I'm going to show you some maps later on, that have down to you know, um, within 100 feet how many people died in a particular incident and why that incident occurred and you know it's it's really pretty eerie stuff gopro cameras facebook 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 if you can get into the secret veterans groups and every specialty greg do you guys have a secret one okay but it, do you know if there's like smaller subunits that okay in, in eod there it, that community has five or six Facebook groups you would never find unless you were looking for them. So talk to your soldier and say to that person, you know, can you get into Facebook and can you see if you can find your buddies? I lost track of everybody that was in my unit shortly after the Gulf War. And then when Facebook came around, all of a sudden we're back together again and it's amazing and we're trading photographs. Um, you know, we're keeping up with each other's lives, obviously. But I've seen photographs I never knew existed because of uh, Facebook. And I've got soldiers now sending me their maps and sending me photographs they took showing me where they were at a particular time. So, and this list is probably going to change like everything. It'll, um, it'll change within a year. There'll be new sources of information. Okay. Here's just a truism. The more recent the war, the more detailed and abundant the records, because you know how we keep records on everything. Would you like to know more? So that's for Sean Lee. Yeah, so. All right. This is a non-governmental organization's detailed records of the global war on terror as it has occurred in Iraq. And what I find interesting is, you know, I mean, it's horrible. And I, yes, I picked red circles for a particular reason, is um, you know, there was, I pay attention to the news and what's happening to soldiers and sailors and, and airmen overseas, and I just never really realized the carnage until I saw this graphically. And you know, you can see that there are some circles that are far larger than 100 people died in that particular instance. And when you get into downtown Baghdad, it's just a mess. But let's kind of zoom in. This is Baghdad right here. Every one of, the, I mean, that's a one person death. So that is probably two or three people died at that exact location. And I've got table data that tells me what happened at that place in time. And so if your soldier or sailor says, I was here 
something happened, you can actually just keyword search the database and pop up all the locations that could possibly be the incident. And let's go in one more. This is, um, this is the airport at Baghdad. You know, this obviously is an IED. Over here, it's on a main highway. And you know, uh, that's more than five people died in that one. And if this is this, you know, the, the neighborhood that surrounds it, there's the main airport. And so here's what the table data looks like. This is the stuff that's available to me just for searching and, and going out and looking. I know the government has better data than this, I just, we haven't done the Freedom of Information Act request to find it. And so my goal is, over the next year, go out, do a bunch of the FOIAs, and get this information, and then put it up on a platform where other folks can access it. And that's one of the things I'm working on, is a sort of publicly available map portal where people can come in, get the data set themselves, do their own analysis, or use the tools that I'm creating to help them do their analysis. Okay, and you, hopefully you can read this. This stuff, you know, this is, who was the attack on, neutrals. This actually says enemy. I realize the resolution's not that good. And, you know, civilian forces, you know, friendlies, enemy combatants, they're all sorted and separated. It's kind of spooky, really. So, what do you do if the government says your record is wrong? Just assume that they're wrong. There are tools out there that you can go use. I, th I don't blame the CIA. I actually think they were trying to do a pretty good job. I've read the, the report that they issued in 97, and I've read the report that they issued in 2002. And there's a lot of assumptions they made, and they came up with a number. Of, it's like any other government report. There's flaws, there's holes, and if you can find the right experts to poke a particular hole into a particular report, um, and you can use you know, either Daubert or Fry methodology to get there, I think you've got uh, a good chance of convincing somebody that um, you know, they were wrong. This area right here, this is Kamasia. This is that big area that Greg was talking about. And this circle around Kamasia, that's far larger than um, six kilometers. That's about a 45 kilometer circle there. These were the, the booms. Now this thing was called Task Force Demo by the, the people that were doing it. And one of the crazy things about the unit logs that I managed to find on the internet was that Task Force Demo had absolutely no positional information. Everything else we did from the time we found um, uh, you know, that burnt out toe laying in the middle of the desert to um, all of our other demo operations, we were recording latitude and longitude. Task Force demo, we've got no info on. So maybe it was just assumed that it was at a particular location and time. And there were multiple EOD people there. There were multiple uh, combat engineers there. And, you know, it was a mess, but it was done by really good, talented people I'd serve with again who just didn't have much time to do it in. So this is the map I made in, in the digital world. And this is just a screenshot, and this is available online. And my plan is to add to this. This is sort of what I do for pro bono. And by the way, I am, uh, am self-employed. I own my own business. I'm not charging for anything to do with veterans, so if you need help on a map, send me an email, send me a phone call. I, you know, this is my passion. I've got other clients I can, I can make my house payment with. So even though I'm private, this is, I want to make sure that I come across as telling you, I'm not trying to drum up business here, okay? So, and you can ask Drake about this, Professor. We talked about this, hallelujah. Okay, so Google Earth. You guys use Google Earth all the time when you're running, wanting to cut a map for court and it's a pretty easy to get into the record source. Uh, what's uh, judicial notice is, I think, Google Map is almost to the level of judicial notice. But you can build custom layers on top of Google Earth, and you can add your own information to this. This is an amazingly powerful tool. It won't do everything my uh, GIS at home will do, but it will do some things even better than my GIS at home will do. And if you need some help on how to, how to use this tool. There are a ton of YouTube videos, and you could always just give me a call as well.
So where can you go for more resources? Definitely Facebook. There's a lot of noise there, and if anybody here is a member of multiple veterans groups, you know it can be a very, very sort of sad place at a lot of times because there's a lot of people out there suffering. And when by the time a veteran gets to the point where things are going really bad and they have to throw something out on Facebook, you know it's a bad life situation. And it's a rough place. But there's also just tons and tons of good information. And if you go on there and you ask questions and you tell them why you're there and what you're trying to accomplish, there are a lot of very capable people that will guide you to the right people or say, hey, I knew a guy that did this once. Let me put you in touch with him. All right. Um, here's one where they're talking about, there's this Larry Sipos fella at the uh, uh, Health and Policy Oversight. I sent him an email the other day I, I, because he's got access to the information that's behind the CIA's reports on Kamasia. I haven't heard back from him yet, but you know, it's the government. It'll be a while. So this is my particular website. It's my work website. I don't want to pay for a lot of different web hosting, so I just sort of have the um, GeoVelo stuff hidden. But let me take you in real quick and just show you how to get to this map and some of the tools. And how am I doing? All right, I'm going to make this real quick. All right, website. I've got uh, this thing called the Desert Storm Mapping Project. You can click there, or you can come here and click on this big friendly graphic. These terms and conditions are actually Google's. I just sort of rewrote them. And then it takes you into an example map. Here's one of my other clients. And then this is called the Veterans Legal Clinic Map, University of Missouri School of Law. And OK, we're zoomed. I'm going to have to do some magic here. That's a lot better. OK. With this little tool here, you can scroll up and down, and you can turn layers on and off. This is the 47th EOD, my unit. I found the logs. I digitized the logs. It took months. Turned uh, this horrible scan that was a JPEG into uh, numbers. And what I found was, because when you're an E5 and you're driving around the desert, you don't really know the big strategic picture, but I knew kind of where we were. I knew we were up by Basra. Well, these were all of our, our bits of work. This was our lane. This was the area we were to destroy um, after the occupation. And it was really cool. And you can click on one of these dots, and the information that's in the actual log comes up over on the side, latitude and longitude. And that particular one was a uh, USSR grenade. And I can't really read it on this monitor either. And oh, PG-7s, those little rocket-propelled grenades. I love those. We blew up a couple million of them, I think, when we were over there. So, and it was on uh, April 91, latitude and longitude. Here's the date and time in Zulu. And that was all in the logs. And you click on that one particular dot. I'd eventually, you know, if we could, map everything we can. There's a way to automate this process. And so that's just one example of the information. Um, and let me turn off these um, various plumes. These, these are the plumes that were modeled by the CIA. This is the 2000 model, you know, the day. And I can't turn off the individual plumes yet, but as I work on the map, some more I will. And here's the global war on terror. Let me, let me show you that turn off the uh, EOD unit stuff. This is, this is Sean Lee's war and, and some other guys here. And ladies, this is just horrific when you look at the total loss of life. And it's, um, it's recorded in some really amazing detail. It was a friendly action, and I just 
clicked randomly. They detained somebody, there was an attack on friendlies, and it looks like one enemy combatant was killed, just clicking on a random dot. And it gives you the date and the time. I've also got possible military presence locations, um, disputed boundary lines in the world, and that'll give you an idea of where the ugly is. All of these yellow areas are areas that are potential conflicts that the U.S. will probably be, eventually be involved in. So there's a lot of information out there. Hopefully you can use it. Uh, I hope you got something out of this presentation. If you have any questions, please let me know. Does anybody have any questions before we take our afternoon break? Any questions you want, or you want to catch Chris at the break? You want to ask a public question? Doesn't anybody want to know how to go from degree minute second to digital degrees? <laughs> Dave. Dave. What I got is a what I got is a passion because my uncle was a Blue Water Navy just like you, and we started talking about this four years ago. I'm building this up, the technology, so when I get a chance to go after those Agent Orange records, and I know they're out there, and they're in some geographic detail, I want to put that out there too, and because. If you're in a small destroyer and you're shelling North Vietnam, we know the maximum range of that gun. We know the Navy shoot, likes to shoot at 80% of maximum. You know exactly how far that destroyer was away. You know that destroyer was taking water in, seawater, boiling it or running it through some of the first really bad reverse osmosis systems. And those soldiers and, or those sailors and Marines were drinking that water. And you know that stuff was flowing down out of North Vietnam, South Vietnam, full of Agent Orange. So, it's not a hard problem. It's just getting the data to, to put it all together. <laughs> yeah. Patrick? Your FOI request, your hosting, your bandwidth, and your cost of lottery. How do you pay for this? Well, lottery. I don't know. It, 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 this really doesn't cost that much to host. It really doesn't. I'm hopefully, we haven't worked it out yet, but I'm hoping Professor Drake over the next couple years will sponsor the, the FOIA requests and handle that, and then I can work with people to digitize the information, and then I can do the GIS stuff. I don't, we need a couple of good solid demos where we really take a, make a difference in a client's case before I think we go selling. Because this is still very much in its infancy. So. Go well, back to John, last one. I have a question. So can you correlate, let's say somebody comes in and they explain that they have been uh, an IDP attack, that they have a traumatic brain injury, they give you a date and time. Can you go in through your, your software and your records and show records from the government where they were in that IEP attack? I can't show the government records because I don't have the government records yet, but I can show some NGO records and I can go to that date and time and, and find if there is a record within about three minutes. So, yeah, it's, it's a quick check. And I want to eventually put it up on the web where everybody can come in and say, my person was in this general area, and we, you know, this was fourth ID district, and on this date, what happened? Where were the bad things? So, and that's not that far away. That's just writing some code. Oh yeah, they're very trusty. Yeah. So. That's why I want the clinic to do the FOIA request. Right, I'm, you know, I'm on some lists, you know. <laughs> yeah, they don't want a letter from me. But Professor Drake, she's got credibility. I think we have cookies ready. Yay! Yay, so everybody take your minute after.